Good morning, web shadowers. We would like to thank you all for attending our session this morning. Today, we have the pleasure of re-hosting Dr. Alborno in OBGYN. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted at the end in the comments. With that being said, Dr. Alborno, you may start sharing your screen whenever you'd like. All right, I'm just setting up a, a dual screen so I can see my speaker notes and then we'll get started. So I just need one second. No problem, thank you so much. Hi guys, I hope everybody's having a great day and that you guys are all excited to learn about some more obstetrics. Um, I'm gonna present to you guys really like a real life case that I had last night. So it's gonna be you know as much in real time as possible and really give you guys a sense that you hung out with me last night on my ship. All right, perfect. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yep. Again. Okay, um, I'm going to go into presentation mode so you guys have that. Um, so I'll just introduce myself again, um, assuming that some of the people who were with us last week are um, not necessarily here today and some of the people who are here with us today weren't here with us last week. So my name is Dr. Dana Elborno and I am an OBGYN in Chicago. My background is that I went to medical school at Loyola in Chicago and I did my residency at University of Chicago. I then spent a one-year fellowship in Toronto um, developing a subspecialty in pediatric and adolescent gynecology at SickKids Hospital. And currently I work for Northwestern um, as an OBGYN generalist and I have a um, niche within my practice for the pediatric and adolescent population. So I'm gonna kind of breeze through the introduction to obstetrics, both as a reminder for the people who were with us last week, but also as a quick primer for people who weren't with us last week. So of course, pregnancy is the state of having products of conception, i.e. an embryo implanted into the uterus, or occasionally somewhere else in the reproductive tract, like the fallopian tube, the ovary, outside of the uterus. And that would be called an ectopic pregnancy, but we are not talking about that today. We are talking about obstetrics when it works. So an embryo actually implanted on the inside of the uterus. And of course, even when um, everything goes as planned, the embryo being implanted on the inside of the uterus as it grows is going to cause a really a myriad of physiologic changes in a pregnant woman that are going to affect every organ system. Everything from the circulatory system to the um, strain put on the heart to how the lungs breathe and the reserve left in the lungs, really truly every organ system. The pregnancy is divided into three trimesters. The first trimester ends at 14 weeks gestational age. The second trimester ends at 28 weeks and the third trimester ends with delivery. Just for a reminder, we date a pregnancy from the first day of the last menstrual period prior to the ovulation that led to conception and implantation. So, a cycle starts on day one with bleeding. Day 14 is usually when ovulation occurs. Around ovulation is when the sperm and the egg will meet, create an embryo, and move from the fallopian tube where they met into the uterus where they will implant about five to seven days later. But for our intents and purposes and for continuity and clarity, we always talk about um, dating a pregnancy from day one of the last menstrual period. Important um, periods of time to know within a pregnancy, aside from the trimesters, are periods of time when the baby would survive if it was delivered on the outside prematurely. So the edge of when a baby would survive versus wouldn't survive if delivered early, either for a medical reason, for maternal health, or a fetal reason for fetal health, or if it just happens spontaneously, that's called viability. And classically, we think of the edge of viability as being 24 weeks, at which point if a baby were to deliver, would most likely survive on the outside. And we'll talk a little bit more later about the 
implications of prematurity and of course survivability is not the only thing we're also talking about meaning for meaningful survivability so we'll talk a little bit more about the implications of prematurity on a later slide um, from anywhere from 24 to 37 weeks is considered preterm at which point the fetus may incur some of those implications of prematurity whether it's you know difficulty breathing difficulty with the gi tract and so on and again we'll cover that later 37 to 42 weeks is considered term, and then 42 weeks and beyond is considered post-term. Important obstetric terms. Whenever we talk about a patient, we always review how many times she's been pregnant and how many times she's delivered a baby, excluding terminations and miscarriages. So we have a very quick and elegant way that we describe this in a language that all obstetricians understand. So whenever we describe to a, pa a patient, um, to another um, OBGYN or to a nurse or you know to a colleague, we're always speaking in terms of G's and P's. G standing for gravita, meaning how many times has the patient been pregnant? Para meaning how many times has she actually delivered a baby that was either term or preterm? And we break up the P into further subcategories of term, preterm, abortions, and living. Abortions being a subcategory that encompasses both elective terminations and spontaneous miscarriages. So for an example, if I was to say that, you know, this patient is a G1P0, that means she's pregnant for the first time. If I were to say she's a G3P2002, just from saying that, I know that she's currently pregnant because she's been pregnant more often than she's delivered i.e. that her G's and P's don't add up, so she must be pregnant. I know that her previous two pregnancies were term deliveries and that she has two living kiddos. If we look at the next one, a G3P2103, from looking at that, I know she's been pregnant three times. She's had two term deliveries, one preterm delivery for a total of three living kiddos. The next patient is a G5, but she's had five miscarriages or terminations. We actually can't tell from that classification, but G5P0050 means no term deliveries, no preterm deliveries, five terminations, less than 20 weeks, whether that was spontaneous or intentional, and zero living kiddos. The next one is a little bit tricky, a G3P3002. So this patient was pregnant three times, had three term deliveries, but only has two living kiddos, implicating that she had one neonatal um, or infant demise. And we further, um, we further uh, explain these categories by terms that you'll hear very often in obstetrics with nulliparous, meaning she's never been pregnant, primiparous, meaning it's her first time being pregnant, and multiparous, meaning she's delivered before. So dating is everything in a pregnancy, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more with our case, but essentially it determines all management. How far along a patient is in her pregnancy determines how long her baby has had to develop on the inside, which also implicates whether or not we would resuscitate a baby. Is it viable? Would we recommend delivery for this condition or not? Is the benefit of getting the baby delivered higher than the risk of getting the baby delivered at this particular tipping point in her pregnancy. So dating is really important to us. And a well-dated pregnancy means she has either a first trimester ultrasound that is consistent with her last menstrual period, and that the last menstrual period is based on regular periods that have predictable ovulation and predictable dating. Um, if you have a really consistent last menstrual period, but you don't have a first trimester ultrasound, we would want your ultrasound to be at least less than 20 weeks to be considered well dated. Um, and if you don't know your last menstrual period, but you have a good first trimester ultrasound, that's still considered well dated. Other ways that we can kind of guesstimate that the patient is beyond term is if it's been 36 weeks since a positive pregnancy test, if it's been more than 30 weeks since the fetal heart tones were heard on an external Doppler during an exam. Um, all, all of those things would reassure us that the patient is term and that it would be safe to proceed with an elective delivery based on the patient being term. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with our case. So our case is a 24 year old G3P0202. So look at those numbers. She's been pregnant three times. She's had two prior preterm deliveries and two living kiddos. She has a singleton pregnancy, meaning only one baby on the inside. That's as opposed to having a twin or a triplet pregnancy. And she presents at 34 weeks and zero days by last menstrual period, consistent with a first trimester ultrasound. So this tells us that she's well dated in this pregnancy. And she had a large gush of fluid that woke her up in the middle of the night. She woke up in a puddle and she's still leaking fluid. She is not reporting any contractions. So when we go to triage to see this patient, we're going to start thinking about what questions we're going to ask her. So the four cardinal questions of obstetrics are, are you having vaginal bleeding? Are you having contractions? Is the baby moving? And are you leaking fluid? So those questions are really unique from a typical history that you would take for a patient, for instance, who wasn't pregnant and had a headache. Um, those questions are important to ask every pregnant patient to get a better sense of what potentially is happening with the baby and her uterus and her pregnancy overall. In addition to that, you're going to ask her prior obstetric history, prior surgical history, gynecologic history, meds, allergies, family history. Um, once we get through the history, then we're going to ask, then we're going to take vital signs and do a standard physical exam. In addition to the standard physical exam that you guys probably learned with your family practitioners, we're also going to do an obstetric exam assessing the baby on the inside. The first thing that we're going to check is fetal lie. So that's assessing the longitudinal axis of the baby from the head to the toes. Is it in the same access as the mom, meaning longitudinal? Are they perpendicular where the baby is transverse or is the baby oblique to the longitudinal axis of the mom? So those are the three potential fetal lies. The possible presentations are either a head, a butt, a foot, a forehead, a chin. Essentially presentation just means whatever is the presenting part. When you reach into the cervix, what do you feel? When you look with ultrasound, the lowest fetal part that is presenting in the lower uterine segment, that's the presentation. And position is what is the orientation of that presenting part in comparison to the maternal pelvis. And I'll show you guys some pictures in a second. We're also going to assess the size of the baby with Leopold's maneuvers. Those are four maneuvers where we actually put our hands on the uterus in four different formations. And I have a picture of that coming up to really assess the size of the baby. Next, we'll move on to a cervical exam. For patients whose bag of water has broken, we favor using a speculum exam as opposed to just a digital exam. So we can actually see the cervix, visualize the fluid in the vagina that's called pooling and is one of the diagnostic criteria for um, ruling in rupture of membranes. And we also can use a nitrazine swab, which is an assessment of the pH of the fluid in the vagina to know whether it's vaginal fluid or amniotic fluid. And I'll show you guys a picture of that in a second. And we can also create a slide from that fluid and see how it dries, how it crystallizes. And that'll give us a sense of whether or not the patient is actually ruptured. And then the last thing, and one of the most important things that we check in obstetrics is getting a sense of how the baby is doing. And usually we get a sense of how the baby is doing in triage with a non-stress test where we put the mom on a fetal heart monitor and we listen to the baby's heartbeat and we look at the tracing. And I'll show you guys an example of that. And I'll talk you through some of the terminology of how we talk about a fetal heart rate tracing. So, over here on the left side of the screen, you can see the various types of fetal lies, both a longitudinal lie with either a vertex, meaning a head presenting part, a breech presenting part, meaning a butt, or a transverse lie, which is the longitudinal axis of the baby is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the mom. Then if you look on the right side of the screen, you'll see the different types of positions for these different um, presentations. So there are different positions that the baby can take, even if it's head down, where the back of the head can either be up towards the 
top of the mom's pelvis, and that's a favorable presentation um, or a fav favorable position for delivery because then the baby is coming facing the floor, looking towards the ground. So the head automatically flexes as it comes through the maternal pelvis, giving the maternal pelvis the smallest diameter of the baby's head, which allows for an effective and easier um, second stage of labor where the mom is actually pushing the baby out. Any of these that say occiput anterior are really favorable positions for pushing. Of course, last night I delivered a patient who was right occiput posterior, meaning the baby is coming out as we describe it, sunny side up, meaning as the baby is coming out of the vagina, it's looking up towards the ceiling. And as the baby is coming out, it actually extends its head to come out into the pelvis, which gives a larger diameter of the baby's head to have to go through the maternal pelvis. So it's a longer um, second stage of labor, meaning it takes longer for the mom to push out that baby and can cause worse perineal tears. Now, if you look down here, the chin can actually present and that's what's called right mentum posterior or left mentum anterior, mentum just meaning the chin. And that can be a dangerous presentation because the head can overextend if the mentum, meaning the chin, is anterior. But if it's posterior, then it'll kind of naturally flex into the pelvis. Um, and then these are different types of breech presentations showing you which way the sacrum is in relation to the mom's pelvis. So these are all terms that we use routinely day in and day out to describe when we're doing a cervical exam, we're doing a vaginal exam, we're trying to get a sense which way is this baby coming? Is it safe to deliver vaginally? Um, we use all of these terms to describe a baby coming out. Now, importantly, we don't do breach vaginal deliveries. So these longitudinal lies where the butt is presenting, we will not do a singleton, meaning a single baby, not a twin delivery. We will not deliver that in a breach presentation. And I'll talk about that a little bit later and why that's a indication for a C-section. This um, slide is explaining Leopold's maneuvers. So Leopold's maneuvers are these four maneuvers, essentially where you use your hands to outline both the uterus and the baby to get a sense of how big the baby is. And that's really something that we do just with experience and time to really be able to correlate what you're feeling with how big a baby is. So the first maneuver is, as you can see, facing towards the mom and using your hands in a forward position along the top of the uterus and trying to feel the fetal parts in the upper pole of the uterus. And that's really to assess both the contour of the top of the uterus and to try to get a sense of what fetal parts are up there. Is it a butt? Are there feet up there? Just to try to feel the fetal parts and see what's going on in the top of the uterus. The second maneuver is really to place your hands on either side of the maternal abdomen as shown in the picture. And then with this maneuver to try to determine where the fetal back is. So once you get a sense that maybe there's a butt and some feet at, up at the top of the fundus, at the top of the uterus, then you're gonna move down and say, okay, which way is my back facing? Is it to my right-hand side? Is it to my left-hand side? The third maneuver is to see what is the presenting part. Um, so that's using your thumb and four fingers um, to really get your hands around whatever is presenting and to kind of move it from side to side, get a sense of if it's engaged in the pelvis, does it move up, does it move to the side? Um, and, and also to try by feel to know what, whether it's a head or not. The fourth maneuver, you're gonna turn your body so that your back is facing the mom and you're gonna use your hands on the opposite side. This last maneuver is to further identify what fetal parts are in the lower part of the uterus to see again and to confirm, okay, the back feels like it's on the right. I feel like some hands and some smaller parts on the left-hand side, for instance. Another way that we assess fetal growth just by clinical exam is actually to measure the top of the uterus from the pubic symphysis as, a, as shown in the right-hand side of the picture um, using just a plain measuring tape. And in general, as your weeks in gestation should correlate with how far above the um, belly button the uterus is measuring. And that is true once you're beyond 20 weeks. 
So we start measuring the uterus pretty routinely at 24 weeks, because at 20 weeks, patients usually get an anatomy scan that assesses the baby's growth. And then at 24 weeks, we start measuring with a measuring tape in every clinical visit to see if the baby is growing appropriately. So those are all things that can be used either in triage or OB visits to assess which way the baby's facing, how big the baby is, and get a sense of um, how fetal growth is. Certainly, we also have ultrasound that we can use um, in the second trimester, third trimester to assess fetal growth. And this is showing you the ultrasonographic views that we can get at the bedside where we first look at the head and we get a head circumference and we get a bipedal diameter measuring across the thalamus in the brain um, in a view where you also see the cavum septum pellucidum, which is a structure that's only present in fetal brains. So getting this view, you can see on the right-hand side what it looks like as a cartoon, as a drawing, and then the left-hand side what it looks like in real life. When you get that view, you freeze your ultrasound and you check both the head circumference and a bipedal diameter. And you can see the bipedal diameter, that arrow is pointing to a perpendicular axis to the axis of the thalamus. And then you can also measure an abdominal circumference in a view where you see both the umbilical vein in the liver and you see a bubble in the stomach. This you can't see as well on the left-hand side, but the, I think the diagram in the cartoon gives you a sense. And a femur length um, you can also use to further plug in all of these numbers into what's called the Hadlock equation to get a sense of the baby's growth. So I use this a lot in triage. If, for instance, the patient doesn't get care with us, we're trying to see how far along she is. Maybe she's never been scanned before. Maybe she had a really early scan, but then not again since. And we suspect she's going to deliver preterm. It's really important to know an estimated fetal weight when you're going to call the NICU and say, hey, guys, we have this baby delivering early. I need you guys to come for delivery. One of the questions they'll ask you is, how big do you think the baby is? And that'll really help them counsel the mom in terms of survivability and resuscitative efforts. So these are some of the tests that we would use to rule in rupture of membrane. So I don't know if you guys remember when we were talking about the physical exam, we said we like to use a speculum, which is actually an instrument that allows us to look inside the vagina, to look for pooling of vaginal fluid. And inside of that vaginal fluid, we can dip a cotton tip applicator that has a pH detector on it. And if the pH is basic, um, the nitrosine detector will turn blue. And if it's acidic, it'll stay yellow. And vaginal fluid is classically known um, as being acidic fluid. And amniotic fluid is well known to be more basic. Um, so if you do have amniotic fluid that has gotten into the vagina, then it would change this nitrosine test. Now it's not a hard and a fast rule because there are some false positives. Blood, semen, um, certain lubricants, and certain infections like bacterial vaginosis or trichomonas can all change the pH of the vaginal fluid and lead to a false positive with this test. This on the right hand side is a slide that looks at ferning. And essentially, we take a swab of the vaginal fluid, we put it on a, on a mount on a slide to dry, and then we look at it under a microscope. Under a low power resolution, dried amniotic fluid, because of the estrogen in the fluid, will cause the salts in the amniotic fluid to create this fern-like pattern, which does not happen with vaginal fluid, does not happen with urine. So if you're ever trying to tell and you're not sure, this is another test that you can use. Sometimes you'll have an equivocal test, meaning your nitrosine's positive, your ferning is kind of you're not sure, seems positive, but it's not super classic. A test that you can use for um, higher sensitivity is something called a ROM plus, which actually detects two amniotic fluid proteins, alpha feta protein and IGF BP1. Both of those protein markers are present in amniotic fluid either in the second trimester or third trimester in high concentrations and are not present in vaginal fluid. So 
you, detecting those proteins in the fluid in the vagina would really increase the chance that the patient is truly ruptured. So for a preterm patient, when the decision is so high stakes and will really determine if you're going to deliver a preterm baby, you really have to know if she's truly ruptured and this is something else you can do. So this is an example of a fetal heart rate tracing. So as I said, one of the things that we're assessing in triage is how is the baby doing on the inside? And is the baby getting normal circulation? Is there an infection? Is the baby well oxygenated? Do you have any concerns about any kind of a placental issue that's preventing the baby from getting normal circulation? And to get a quick and dirty kind of assessment of whether or not um, the baby's doing well on the inside, we can look at a non-stress test where we actually look at the baby's heart rate from beat to beat and we measure it over 20 to 30 minutes. And what you guys will notice here is that the baby's heart rate is usually, I know these numbers are a little bit blurry, but this number on the left-hand side where the fetal heart rate tracing starts is 150. And you'll notice that that's usually where the baby spends most of its time is around 150. But then there are occasional times the baby's heart rate will go up by more than 10 beats and will last for more than 10 seconds. And that's a good thing. That's called an acceleration where the baby's heart rate goes up from the baseline for a period of time and comes back down. And that's a sign of a well oxygenated baby that's responding to stimuli on the outside and responding to its own movements by elevating its heart rate appropriately. Sometimes you'll look at a heart rate tracing and it's pretty flat. Um, one of the things that we can do to assess if the baby will have an acceleration is actually put a little vibrating stimulator on the outside of the belly. And usually if the baby's sleeping and that's why the heart rate tracing just looks a little bit flat, that will usually wake up the baby and give us a nice axel and reassure us that the baby's oxygenation is normal and that reflex is still present. One of the other things that you'll notice is that there's some variability from beat to beat. We say it's usually around 150 at the baseline, but you'll see that it's kind of like 149, 150, 151, 152. That's a good thing. Beat to beat variability, again, shows um, and reflects a sign of a well oxygenated baby that's kind of responding to changing stimuli in its environment and has good variability in its heart rate tracing um, accordingly. So if that was lacking uh, and the heart rate tracing was flat, uh, had no variability, had no axels, that's telling us that this baby is probably not well oxygenated. Another thing that would be concerning for further um, circulatory insufficiency from the mom to the baby would be if we saw dips in the heart rate. So a deceleration is a bad thing because that is a reflection that the baby's not getting enough oxygen. There's a fetal, refle a fetal reflex that low oxygen levels getting to the brain will cause the heart rate to drop. And if it happens for a short period of time, it could be transient cord compression, like the baby just pressed on its own umbilical cord or with a contraction, the umbilical cord gets a little squished. That's not a big deal, it can happen and it's not concerning. Or if the baby's coming down into the pelvis with contractions, with pushing, as the baby's head gets squeezed, that'll also cause the same reflex for the heart rate to drop, and that's a normal thing to happen. But if the baby's heart rate is dropping in a recurrent way, and kind of like these subtle drops after every contraction, that's a sign that there is some kind of insufficiency in this blood flow from the uterus to the placenta to the baby and makes us a little bit more concerned about the baby's oxygenation. When we look at these heart rate tracings, we say that it's category one, two, or three. Category one, meaning it's beautiful, it's perfect, I have nothing to say about it. Category three, meaning it's a disaster. Everything about the tracing is telling us that the baby is not doing well and we gotta go for a delivery as soon as possible. Category two is everything in between. Some things are reassuring, some things are a little abnormal, and then you just got to correlate it with a clinical picture of what else is going on. This here is a category one tracing. And the line on the bottom is actually measuring uterine contractions. And for the most part, I'd say we probably only had one. The line is moving around a little bit. It's a little bit quivery, probably just irritability, but I don't really see anything that looks like a true contraction except for in the middle of the tracing. 
So in terms of what we learned about our baby from our assessment and triage, we found that the baby has a longitudinal lie. We did a bedside growth scan, which confirmed that the baby is measuring in the 50th percentile around 2,500 grams. We confirmed vertex presentation, meaning the head is the presenting part. And we also confirmed that the amniotic fluid is low, which it correlates with the clinical picture because this woman's bag of water broke. On her sterile speculum exam, we saw pooling. It was nitrazine and ferning positive. So I did not do a ROM plus because the clinical picture is very consistent with um, rupture of membranes. And on clinical exam, the cervix also looks closed. On NST, it was just the one that I showed you now, which is a baseline of 150 beats per minute, moderate variability, mean, meaning the heart rate goes up and down from beat to beat in a reassuring way. There are accelerations, there are no decelerations, and there was a rare contraction. So if you guys were on a clinical rotation with an obstetrician or on labor and delivery, and that was the report that you gave me from coming back and seeing a patient in triage, it would be beautiful. That would be all the information that I would wanna know. Once we've confirmed that her bag of water is broken, we now have to start thinking about the management. So remember that this patient is 34 weeks. And usually we do not collect a test in prenatal care called group beta strep to test for a pretty common bacteria in the vagina that doesn't affect moms, doesn't create symptoms in moms, but if a baby is exposed to it due to the low immunity of the baby, can cause symptoms and problems, complications for the baby like sepsis, meningitis, pneumonia, and so on. So we always screen for it at 36 weeks, but if a patient comes to us with an indication for delivery sooner than that, she's considered GBS unknown. And if she's preterm, like this patient is, she needs to be treated with antibiotics to cover her just in case. We also collected a urinalysis, urine cultures, and vaginal swabs to screen for infection because infection is one of the common causes of why the bag of water might break um, so early and outside of the context of labor. The last thing that we'll want to know is what her cervical exam is exactly so that we can figure out how to best induce her labor. So when we do a cervical exam, and we actually put a finger inside the cervix and we feel the cervix, we're not only looking for how open the cervix is, we're also looking for how thinned out it is, how low the baby is in the pelvis, and the consistency of the cervix as well as the position in relation to the baby's head. So anytime you're inducing someone's labor, for any clinical indication when they're not already in labor, but you need them to be. You need to know all five of those components so that you can calculate what's called a Bishop score. And a Bishop score can tell you how favorable the cervix is for induction, i.e. with contractions alone, will the cervix open and help you have a vaginal delivery? And if the Bishop score is low, i.e. lower than six or eight, depending on the literature that you read, then that would be a sign that there needs to be a step prior to contractions to help give the cervix a little bit more give so that with contractions, the cervix actually opens. So this patient, when we checked her, she was a centimeter and a half dilated, 50% thinned out. So what that means thinning out is that a typical cervix is around three to five centimeters long prior to the onset of labor. During labor, the cervix is going to become paper thin and kind of continuous with the lower uterine segment. So anywhere in between five centimeters and paper thin is going to be a percentage of how thinned out it is. So 50% thinned out means she has about two, two and a half centimeters left of cervix in the long axis. It has a medium um, cervical consistency, meaning it's starting to soften, but it's not completely soft. And the cervical position is mid, meaning that in relation to the baby's head, the cervix is not behind the baby's head, nor is it in front of the baby's head, where the cervix should end up in order to affect a normal vaginal delivery. So to calculate a Bishop score for her, she would get a one for cervix, she'd get a one for cervical effacement, 
she would get a one for station, a one for cervical consistency, and a one for cervical position. So that would be a total of five, meaning she's not yet favorable and would need some kind of um, ripening to have a more favorable cervix for induction of labor. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, on our next slide. So her diagnosis is premature, preterm rupture of membranes at 34 weeks. And for her, because she's late preterm, meaning that the baby's um, organs are mostly developed and at this point keeping the baby on the inside with a ruptured bag of water without any delivery happening in an immediate time period would only increase the baby and the mom's risk for infection without improving neonatal outcomes. Less than 34 weeks, there's benefit to keeping the baby on the inside to grow a little bit more. And even though there's a higher risk of infection, it's worth it to keep the baby on the inside to grow. Um, but after 34 weeks, that tipping point changes at which point the baby's grown pretty well and the risk of infection is high enough that the benefits are outweighed by the risks. So the treatment is to induce labor and get the baby out. So PPROM again means preterm prior to 37 weeks, premature meaning before the onset of labor. So like in the movies, people are like contracting, they're hunched over and then their bag of water breaks in a restaurant and they go to the hospital and have a baby. But in real life, sometimes the bag of water just breaks and they're not in labor at all. And that's a premature rupture of membranes. Um, and rupture of membranes, of course, meaning that the amniotic sac around the baby now has a hole and opening in it, so the amniotic fluid is running out. Why does this occur? Why would somebody pee prom and break their bag of water so early in their pregnancy? So like this patient, she's had two prior preterm deliveries, and that's a risk factor for it to happen again. As I told you guys before, anytime someone asks you, why does this occur? What's a risk for this? What's a risk for this to occur? You just say, well, if it happened before. Um, a history of this thing happening before is a good predictor that it might happen again to this patient. If they have a short cervical length throughout their pregnancy, they're at a higher risk for the shearing forces on the amniotic sac to cause it to break and to have an early rupture of membranes. Any kind of bleeding can cause uterine irritability and um, increase the inflammation on the amniotic sac and cause it to break early. Low body mass index, low socioeconomic status, cigarette smoking, illicit drug use, infection in the membranes or the uterus or anywhere in the abdomen, like an appendicitis can sometimes lead to PPROM or a cholecystitis, an infection in the gallbladder. Um, more classically, we think about chorioamnionitis, which is an infection in the membranes and the uterus itself. Having two babies on the inside means that your uterus distends bigger than it would have with a singleton gestation, so that puts a lot more distension forces on the uterus and can cause a bag of water to break early. If there's a uterine anomaly where the uterus has an abnormal shape, that can also cause it to distend poorly and for the bag of water to break early, as can other maternal conditions like preeclampsia because of poor circulation to the placenta and a poorly um, vascularized amniotic sac, which is just weaker and can break more easily. And lastly, medical procedures can cause PPROM like an amniocentesis where we put a needle on the inside of the amniotic sac to pull out fluid either to diagnose infection or to assess um, the fetus as genetic material for a suspected chromosomal abnormality. So what are the outcomes of PPROM? What happens when somebody has a rupture of membranes preterm? What can you tell them? You can say that regardless of what we do, about 50% of patients will go on to deliver within a week. Your latency, meaning the time between when your bag of water broke and the time to when you'll go into delivery, increases if you are earlier in your pregnancy. So if your bag of water breaks at 25 weeks, the obstetric best outcome would be to keep you pregnant until 34 weeks. Um, and the likelihood that that would happen is pretty low to keep you pregnant until 34 weeks, but you have a higher likelihood of staying pregnant beyond that one week 
um, latency that's predicted for 50% of PPROMs because of how early your bag of water broke. There's a 15 to 35% risk of infection. Once the bag of water is open, then vaginal bacteria and bacteria from the rectum, the anus, can kind of ascend and travel into the bag of water in the membranes, which can cause chorioamnionitis. And about two to 5% of the time, the sudden drop in volume inside the uterus can cause shearing forces on the placenta, which can cause it to prematurely separate from the lining of the uterus. And this can either be clinically recognized abruption with bleeding that comes out of the vagina and out of the cervix and you see it, or it can be a um, obstructed abruption where the placenta is far from the cervix and the bleeding is all happening in the middle of the placenta. And our only indication that this is happening is that the baby's heart rate tracing looks poor um, and the mom is having severe abdominal pain. And we would start to suspect that maybe this is, maybe the placenta is um, separating early and that would be an obstetric emergency and an indication for immediate delivery. So what are the risks to the fetus? Um, the main risks to the fetus are risks of prematurity. So remember I told you that a baby is supposed to stay on the inside for at least 37 weeks because it's developing vital organs and those vital organs are becoming mature on the inside to be able to transition to life on the outside. If the baby is born early, it has not yet undergone this process and is at risk of developing respiratory distress syndrome because the lungs are poorly developed, sepsis from increased risk of infection, necrotizing enterocolitis because the intestines are poorly developed, don't have good circulation yet. And when they're on the outside and the circulation isn't coming from the mom, parts of the bowel can actually have poor oxygen, become ischemic and necrotic, and that would be a surgical emergency. Intraventricular hemorrhage due to weak blood vessels in the brain that can bleed very easily when baby comes onto the outside. And also these patients who have PPROM have an increased risk for neurodevelopmental delay compared to prematurity from other etiologies due to increased white matter destruction um, related to PPROM. Probably related to infection, if I had to guess, I'm not really sure, but it's just something that's been clinically recognized. If the bag of water breaks before the baby is viable or around the time of viability. Remember viability, meaning at what point would the baby survive on the outside if it were to deliver early? Uh, if there was a pre-viable PPROM, that's usually associated with stillbirth or neonatal death. Even if the baby continues to grow on the inside, the lack of amniotic fluid being around the environment um, where the baby is growing is going to prevent the lungs from developing at all. It's called pulmonary hypoplasia. That is not a condition that is consistent with life. And also because of the lack of fluid in there, the baby is going to have what's called potter facies because the face is pressed right up against the uterine wall and limb contractures because the limbs on the inside could never extend and flex normally. So if for whatever reason, a patient decided to maintain the pregnancy and she wants to try and see what happens, understanding her risk of infection and understanding the potentially poor outcomes for the baby, we would just have to counsel her that, hey, listen, even if the baby stays on the inside and you don't get infected and we just wait and watch and see what happens, this baby's predicted to do pretty poorly on the outside once detached from the placenta and relying on its own lungs to breathe because the lungs cannot develop surfactant, a very vital protein um, to help the alveoli distend with breath and exhale with breath. And the lungs would essentially be hypoplastic, poorly developed and not functional. I think that that's a really important point to bring up because a lot of people, when I tell them I'm an obstetrician, they're always like, oh my God, what a happy job. And they're right. It is happy some of the time, but some of the time it's devastating. Having to tell a mom who has been carrying her pregnancy for five months that now her bag of water is broken and 
no matter what she does, the baby's lungs are not going to develop. The baby's never going to survive on the outside and that we're recommending an induction to terminate her pregnancy. I mean, those are hard conversations to have, especially for a desired and a planned pregnancy. You know, a family at five months is planning their whole life around this baby coming in another four or five months. So I think that that's a really important thing to be aware of as you're considering a job in obstetrics and gynecology that yes, our job sometimes is a very joyful moment and there are tears of joy that you shed probably on every shift, but there's also moments that are really soul crushing. <coughs> Just a second to get my breath and then we'll keep going. So the management of PPROM really depends on at what point the mom's bag of water broke. And that'll really help dictate that tipping point at which the risks of keeping the baby on the outside are outweighed by the benefits of the baby growing on the inside and then when it's time to move towards delivery. And I'll give you an example. If a baby's bag of water breaks at 30 weeks and you know the obstetric intention is to keep the baby in for another four weeks i'm okay i'm still okay. in here thank you so much sorry about that <laughs> just start cleaning service so um so we were saying that a patient's bag of water breaks at 30 weeks and the obstetric intention we say our obstetric tipping point for when it it's better for the baby to deliver than to stay on the inside is at 34 weeks. Well, if her bag of water breaks and her placenta starts abrupting and she's having heavy vaginal bleeding and the fetal heart, tra heart rate tracing is a category three or category two, you are not keeping that patient pregnant because the risks in her particular situation are far outweighed or far outweigh the benefits of potentially additional fetal development on the inside. Um, another situation is if there's already evidence of infection, um, both that could be a severe risk factor for the mom and for the baby. Moms can become septic and go into shock if there's an infection that's untreated and sitting in the inside. At some point, you have to remove the nidus of infection. And certainly, if there's ever any evidence of infection, even if it's at 24 weeks of the ruptured bag of water, because of the risk to the mom, you have to deliver the baby. Um, as we said, vaginal bleeding should increase the risk or increase the concern that you have for a abrupted placenta, which should prompt consideration of delivery depending on what the heart rate tracing looks like, the amount of bleeding, and the gestational age. So in our situation, the mom was 34 weeks gestational age, meaning it's very reasonable to move towards delivery. The baby's lungs should be pretty well developed. Um, to be able to transition to life on the outside, as should all the other organ systems. Um, as you'll see here, that induction or cesarean as appropriate or indicated. So just because it's time to move towards delivery does not mean that this patient needs a C-section. PPROM is not an indication for C-section. It's an indication for delivery, and we'll talk on our next slide about making the decision between induction of vaginal delivery and a cesarean section. You'll see that the next point of management is a single course of corticosteroids. So this is something new that we're doing in management called antepartum late preterm steroids, giving the mom intramuscular steroids, which have been shown to help the baby's lungs develop better. If the mom was less than 34 weeks, we would give these steroids and wait for 48 hours before considering delivery if time allowed, because less than 34 weeks, we really want steroids on board to help the baby's lungs develop. Beyond 34 weeks, it's kind of icing on the cake and you do not need to wait for the full course of steroids, which is two shots, 24 hours apart, with the maximal benefit from the steroids being 48 hours after the first shot. Um, this is a clinical scenario where you don't wait for the steroid course, you can give it and simultaneously start inducing labor. Um, GBS screening and prophylaxis is indicated. So as we said, her GBS status was unknown. And remember, GBS is group beta strep, an infection that 
is present in around 20% of women at any given time, has implication for mom, can have an implication for baby, and that we screen for it in all pregnancies at 36 weeks. Her GBS status was unknown, and because she's preterm and the baby's at higher risk of infection, we would treat her with penicillin. And certainly if the patient is showing any signs of intraamniotic infection, either with fetal tachycardia, meaning an elevated fetal heart rate, maternal tachycardia, meaning an elevated maternal heart rate, a maternal fever, or fundal tenderness, where you press the patient's abdomen and she's like out of control um, tender, those would all potentially be signs that chorioamnionitis, an intrauterine infection has already started. And then you would actually treat with more aggressive antibiotics like IV ampicillin and IV gentamicin, as opposed to just doing the penicillin alone. So in terms of whether or not to do an induction of labor versus a C-section, these are kind of general rules of when we would move straight to a C-section. So if you have concern for fetal well-being, remember that patient I told you about 30 weeks, vaginal bleeding, shit tracing, sorry, excuse my language. I'm post so my, you know, French starts to come out a little bit, but she has a category three tracing. She has vaginal bleeding. She has a closed cervix. That is not a patient that you're going to induce vaginal delivery because it takes time and times of the essence we're concerned about the baby and we're concerned about the mom with her vaginal bleeding. So that would be an indication to do an emergency C-section. If there's a placental issue, like the placenta is blocking the cervix, that's called the placenta previa, or the placenta is abnormally implanted and there's no um, plane between the placenta and the uterus, those would potentially be indication, or those would be, sorry, not potentially, those would be indications to move forward with a C-section as a vaginal delivery would not be safe. If there's malpresentation, so remember when we were talking about the presenting part, certain presentations are consistent with a vaginal delivery and other ones are not. In general, it's only a head presenting that is consistent with a vaginal delivery when you're talking about a singleton gestation. Um, a transverse lie with like an arm presenting, it's not going to be a possibility for a vaginal delivery. A longitudinal lie with a breech presenting, remember that's the butt presenting, that is not consistent with a safe vaginal delivery. Um, or if there's a like forehead presenting that's an overextended head and that's not safe to do a vaginal delivery. And remember we said the chin can sometimes present, but the chin has to be anterior um, to be able to flex normally as it comes down. And if it's posterior, then that's really dangerous. It can get super, super hyperextended. So that would be a, um, an indication to do a C-section. The last thing is if there's a prior uterine surgery excluding low transverse C-section. So if this patient had a large fibroid that was taken out or she had a prior classical C-section, meaning a C-section through the entire uterine muscle in an up and down fashion, um, that would mean that the uterine muscle itself has a scar on it. And as it contracts, that scar could potentially open up and it would not be safe to have a um, a labor course with contractions and a vaginal delivery. So that patient would, ne would necessarily have to have a C-section. Um, lastly, just to quickly review how to induce labor. So you guys remember the Bishop score that we talked about where we said, how dilated is she? How thinned out is the cervix? Um, what's the consistency of it? How low is the baby's head? What's the relationship between the cervix opening and the baby's head? You have to calculate a Bishop score and based on the Bishop score and how ripe the cervix is, that's the word for it. Um, it's kind of used interchangeably with a favorable cervix. Um, that's really gonna determine how you'll induce labor. Because if you imagine that the cervix is the door, the opening to the uterus, if you're just pressing like knocking on a really hard closed door, it's not gonna open. But if that door is made out of jello, probably just push into it a little bit and it opens. So our goal is to make the cervix feel like it's made out of jello. Uh, and of course you have to rule out any contraindications to vag vaginal delivery like the ones that we just talked about. Options for labor induction include um, prostaglandins, mechanical, um, mechanical modalities of um, 
of ripening the cervix, um, artificially rupturing the bag of water, and pitocin to create contractions. So for this patient, her Bishop score was like five. It's kind of borderline. And her cervix had started that important remodeling process, which is a necessary part of delivery, where the collagen breaks down and the um, glycosaminoglycans kind of rearrange and there's increased production of cytokines and inflammation to turn a hard, thick cervix into something that feels like jello. Um, and prostaglandins play a really important part of that cervical remodeling process and they're natural, naturally released from the amniotic bag and the lower uterine segment as they kind of start to move on each other with early labor contractions that will release some prostaglandins, which helps soften the cervix. If the patient comes to you ready for induction and has not yet had this process happen, then you can use prostaglandins to help soften her cervix, open it a little bit, and make it more favorable for um, a contraction forward induction with just Pitocin alone. Pitocin is essentially a hormone similar to oxytocin, which is released from the pituitary gland in this very important and normal labor, which the uterus is very sensitive to in the late second and third trimester that has um, a reaction to having the uh, pitocin or oxytocin receptors activated with uterine contractions, rhythmic uterine contractions. Um, and very early pregnancies, there are not a lot of oxytocin receptors. So the uterus doesn't really respond much if you gave it oxytocin. In later gestations, there's a lot more oxytocin receptors and the uterus responds really nicely to pitocin. The nicest thing about pitocin is that it only um, stays in the circulation for about three to five minutes. So we have to run it as an infusion. It sounds cumbersome, but it's a good thing because if there's a, um, concern about fetal well-being and reaction to contractions, like let's say you start the Pitocin and your contractions are really frequent or the baby's heart rate is dropping with every contraction and it looks um, not reassuring, you can always turn down your amount of Pitocin and within three to five minutes, there's gonna be less Pitocin in the mom's circulation. And that will be reflected in less frequent contractions or no contractions depending on where she is in her labor um, course. So that's pretty much all I have on PPROM and induction of labor. Um, and this is the quote I used last time because I couldn't come up with something new, but essentially I'm so encouraged and optimistic by the amount of people who have joined these web shadowing opportunities. And I'm sure that you're all gonna go on to be very smart and capable colleagues of mine in the future and I look forward to working with all of you. Welcome to our community. I think you'll find that the people that you train with in medical school and in residency are going to be some of the smartest, hardest working people that you'll ever meet and it'll always push you to be the best version of yourself. So it's a very exciting career. Even when it's tiring, it's always rewarding and I look forward to answering any questions. So I'm going to get out of this. I'll just give you one reminder that I'm speaking on October 5th on a more gynecologic topic um, about polycystic ovarian syndrome in adolescents. And I'd love if you guys join me for that talk. I think it'll be really interesting combining a lot of endocrinology and reproductive physiology um, all into one lecture. And I'm just gonna get out of sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do it. <laughs> Uh, pause, share. Thank you so much, Dr. Alborno. This was such a wonderful and very um, interesting to learn presentation. We all appreciate you so much. You guys are so sweet. Thank you so much for joining. Um, Everyone make sure. I, I have time for like a couple probably only like three or four questions. So do you want me to take some questions or? Yeah. Yes, um, we have we'll send them over to you. We have some in the chat. Okay, awesome. And everyone who attended, thank you so much. The link to the Google form is now posted and it's about to be in our Instagram bio. So please remember you need to fill it out in the next 30 minutes if you want us to receive verification of your attendance.
Okay, so I have a question. What if the patient is allergic to penicillin or one of the others that you mentioned? And that's a great question. And that's actually one of the things that we routinely check sensitivities to group beta strep. So if a patient is group beta strep positive and she's penicillin allergic, we'll check the sensitivities of the group beta strep that she has and we'll check to see if she's sensitive to clindamycin. Um, and depending on how severe her allergy is to penicillin, she may also be a candidate to receive ANCEF, which is a cephalosporin. It's still a beta lactam, so pharmacologically similar to penicillin, but there's only 10% reactivity or cross reactivity with allergies. So if she doesn't have like an anaphylactic reaction to penicillin, we'd probably try her with ANCEF. And if she does have anaphylactic reaction, then we would know the sensitivities and use clindamycin or um, vancomycin, depending on the sensitivities. And if the sensitivities are unknown, like for this patient, we you know, didn't know her GPS status, we were treating her empirically, empirically meaning on the basis that she might have it and that she's preterm as a preventative measure, then we would probably have to give her vancomycin, which is, which definitely covers group beta strep. I mean, it's a pretty big gun for antibiotics, but if she has a severe penicillin reaction, it's the only option that we have really. Um, other questions are, what's your opinion of the medicalization of delivery? So that's a great and a very complex question. I would say that in terms of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that we create a lot of space for patients to have minimal medical interventions and safe vaginal deliveries without many interventions. Um, but I think ultimately there's a picture that's painted of obstetricians that were like trying to do all these C-sections and trying to scare all these moms from something their body was like made to do. But the reality is like, whenever someone tells me like women have been doing this for like hundreds of years, it's like, well, women and babies have also been dying in childbirth for hundreds of years. I mean, the reality is having a baby is the most dangerous thing an American woman will do in her lifetime. And our goal is to minimize that risk and to have a happy, healthy baby, happy, healthy mom at the end of it. So yeah, I mean, sometimes the lavender aromatherapy gets you know shoved to the side and there is an indication to do more medical intervention and either to do a C-section, do a forcep delivery, you know, continuously monitor the baby, like need to give different medications, augment the labor process. But I mean, our goal and our intention is always for a safe labor process, which leads to a healthy delivery of a mom and a baby. And I think if you find yourself in a certain rabbit holes, you'll see that there's all these stories of people who are so afraid of the medicalization of delivery that they have home births. And home births have a well-known risk for an intrauterine fetal demise. It's two times the rate of a fetal demise happening in the hospital. And there are some real horror stories. Like I've personally cared for patients where the baby was butt down and this like you know, person who called themselves a midwife, probably didn't have much training, was monitoring this mom's labor for like three days, kind of on and off. And this mom was laboring the whole time. And the baby came to us like barely hanging on and definitely not exiting that vagina. And it was, you know, a real example to me of how people can be so afraid of medicine and also like demonize people who work in the medical field when the reality is like we're just trying to make sure that your baby's head down and coming down safely and that the baby can fit in the pelvis and that you know this is all going to end in a healthy delivery so i gotta be honest that like this real push for like birth plans and like natural and you know like bring a support person and like, you know, tell the obstetrician that you're not going to do anything that they recommend. And that's been kind of like a frustrating thing, but I honestly don't interact with it that often. I would say that for the most part, our patients are very much on board with us just 
listen, like I want to play Enya and have lavender aromatherapy if I can. But at the end of the day, if you're concerned about me, you're concerned about my baby, like let's get the show on the road and have a delivery, whatever way we need to, to make sure that the baby and I'm healthy. Um, do I ever have patients who insist on natural vaginal birth instead of C-section, even if it's not safe? I have, and I think the main way that I've dealt with it is just to give them time. If I have time, like if it's a less urgent situation, let's say for instance, they push for three hours, the baby's still high. We're concerned that the baby's not going to come out of the pelvis. We don't feel comfortable offering an operative vaginal delivery because of the position of the baby and the suspected fetal weight. Uh, and we talk to the mom about a C-section, but if the fetal heart rate tracing looks good and the mom is like, absolutely not, I don't want this, I'll talk to them about it. I'll leave, come back, leave, come back. It's kind of like a slower process. And of course, if it's like a true obstetric emergency, like the mom is bleeding out, the baby's heart rate is like crashing. I've honestly, I've never had a patient who's like, no, do not take me for a C-section. I mean, I think they see the urgency in our eyes and they see the urgency on the side of our team. That's like, especially if you have rapport with that patient, they know that you respect them, you care for them, you want to give them transparent communication and time. When they see you say, we do not have time to talk about this and we need to get the baby out. I've never had a person tell me no. Um, is there a way to move the baby to a better exiting position? Of course there is. It's called an external cephalic version. Um, and it's a way to manipulate the baby from being butt down to being head down. You can do it when the mom has an epidural and you can give her a medication called terbutaline, which is a beta agonist, which relaxes the uterus. And then you can use ultrasound and manual manipulation of the baby to get the baby into a head down position. Um, and it works about 50% of the time, especially if the mom's had babies before, if the placenta is in the back of the uterus, um, if the mom's BMI is not too high and you can actually do like a real good Leopold's and feel where the baby's back is, get hands on the baby's butt in the lower part of the uterus, really push it up, feel the baby's head and kind of do like a forward roll. Um, like in this direction. And if that doesn't work, you can try to do a backward roll in this direction. Works about 50% of the time. The other 50% of the time doesn't work, but then you have your epidural and then we'll do your C-section. Um, what aftercare occurs with a C-section? Um, so C-sections are like most intra-abdominal surgeries, only complicated by the fact that there's a new baby that needs care. So with a C-section, what really differs from general postoperative care and enhanced recovery is that we really are thinking about the medications that we give and whether or not they're friendly for breastfeeding or not, depending on whether or not the patient's breastfeeding. And we're thinking very much about enhanced recovery because we want the patient to get out of bed, pee, start walking around, showering, eating and drinking, and like caring for herself as quickly as possible to improve like bonding with the baby and being able to care for the baby before she goes home. How often would I say that babies are born in an emergency room? Very, very rarely. I actually, I mean, some of my closest friends are ER docs from medical school and they talk to me often about how they'll do anything they can if they, if a mom is like, seems like she's laboring to get her up to LND, like they will move mountains to get her up to LND because they're not really that well equipped to handle deliveries in the ER. Um, you you know, obviously occasionally it happens at my old hospital, we called it a code stork. They would call it overhead and we would like go running to the ER. Um, and it was a definitely fun superhero moments for like the crowds part and everyone's like, where's OB, where's OB? They just, you know, for people who are comfortable with deliveries, we're really comfortable with it. And the people who are not comfortable with it are very uncomfortable with it. I think ER residents need to have like five or 10 deliveries or something to graduate residency, but they'll do that on a rotation with us. It would be very uncommon for them to get those vaginal deliveries just during their ER rotations. Um, I think those are 
most of the questions. I'll just take this last one. Have you dealt with patients who are drinking or using drugs during a pregnancy? How is this dealt with? Yes, that is very common. We have an opioid crisis in this country and we have sadly too many patients who are chronic opioid users during pregnancy. The care for a patient like that is a multidisciplinary approach with both addiction medicine involved, maternal fetal medicine involved, psychi like psychology or therapy, uh, and potentially psychiatry, depending on whether or not addiction medicine is internal medicine or psych, they might want a psychiatrist involved, um, and very, very, very close monitoring. Patients who are chronic opioid users, there could be an indication to start them on a long-acting opioid like Suboxone um, to help with preventing short-term short opioid abuse and potentially can have a very safe vaginal delivery with using those longer-acting opioids. Um, and I really think the name of the game is just super close follow-up. Um, and just trying to really hold people accountable as much as possible to being open to being honest so that we know what risks to expect for their baby. We know how to counsel them and how to prepare for neonatal resuscitation accordingly. Uh, and that's pretty much it, guys. It was so nice to spend this Tuesday morning with you. And I look forward to hearing from you guys later in the day. If you have any questions, you can always um, send me a message on my Instagram. I'll probably be sleeping for a lot of today. So um, don't feel bad if I don't respond right away. I just am in a pile of post-call sleep with my dog. Um, but I will try to get back to as many of you as I can. And I, again, I just encourage everybody. I'm so proud of you all for making the effort to do this. And if there's anything that I can do to help you in your journeys to build medical careers, don't ever hesitate to reach out. Um, and, you know, I know this is all online, but truly consider everyone who's attending, like as if you're doing a rotation with me. So, you know, if there's anything I can do to help you figure out your career, your goals, or, you know, whatever, I'll try to be as available as I can be. So thank you so much for your time and for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Dr. Alborno. We can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much. All right. Yes. October 5th, guys, we'll talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome. And if you have any questions about PCOS and you want to make sure I answer them, you can always send me a direct message too um, to send questions in advance so I can make sure to address it in the presentation. Okay. Awesome. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Have a, have a nice sleep. Thank you. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye. Take care.